Thank you guys for uh, sticking around. I thought most of you would have gone home or something like that, seeing that a dietitian is going to be speaking. Um, but, you know, my journey, I will be talking to you a little bit about my journey and what it took for me to essentially go from a guidelines practicing dietitian to where I am today. Um, so today I also will be talking to you about translating nutrition theory from LCHF theory into practical how does it look like on your plate, what does it look like in a day. But uh, the disclaimer is as of now I am still an APD. So I haven't been discredited uh, by my organisation but I definitely don't know how long that might be. So I want to talk a little bit about me. So there's me there. I graduated in 2008, so in 2008 I graduated from Monash University um, and I at the time was just really excited to be no longer having to study and do late night you know, cram sessions and I hadn't always wanted to be a dietitian. Um, very originally I actually got into law school and my path was, oh I'm going to go to law school and, and be a lawyer. Um, but something didn't quite sit right with me and I thought, you know what, I actually am very, very interested in health science. I'm just going to move a little bit more away from that. Um, and it was at that point that I went, oh, I don't know if I really actually want to do law anymore. I actually really, really want to do something health science related. But what do I do at this point? Now, I didn't do particularly well in the UMAT, which is the Undergraduate Medical Entrance Examination. And so my, my options at that point were pretty limited. So my mum actually went, well, why don't you look into, you know, nutrition and dietetics? I'm like, I've never even heard of that course before. And so um, I did look into it and it was fascinating, but I thought, you know, I'll use this as my way of transitioning maybe into medicine or something like that. Um, but as the classes rolled on, I actually felt that I was really, really fascinated with nutrition. And um, so as the years rolled on in the, in the course, I was actually really enjoying myself and I thought you know what I'm not going to I'm not going to go into medicine I just want to become a dietitian so when I graduated I was really happy um, obviously the world was my oyster and I couldn't be more excited but then came the real life test of becoming a dietitian so I break down my eras in my nutrition journey to now into three different phases so phase number one was actually from 2009 to 2013 and that was my passionately ignorant phase. So it was during this phase that I was very much a guidelines promoter. Everything was fat free, everything was low fat, we were portion controlling everything um, and that was just the way things were at that point. And you know whilst I did get um, results for some people it wasn't consistent and the, consistency, the inconsistency of the results I was getting my clients was really disturbing. And so for me, um, I really actually wanted to find out a way where I could, you know, get people more consistent results. Now, doing this way of eating, I got a few, you know, common complaints through clients, not, not serious complaints, but they were saying, I'm always hungry, you know, um, I feel like I'm not getting enough energy and uh, even though my blood markers are improving, I don't feel like I'm, you know, quite getting the most out of every day. And it got me really scratching my head and I was sort of, without even realising, upping their proteins to compensate. So I was like, oh, you know, eat a bit more protein and, you know, lo and behold, it worked to an extent. Um, they were feeling a lot more satisfied and they were happy. But then came this phase and it wasn't that long ago and you're probably thinking, oh, so you've only been doing this for a really short amount of time and the answer is absolutely correct. And this was actually my turning point. My turning point comes in two different phases. The first one is PCOS. So I have PCOS and I was diagnosed with PCOS from quite a young age, so when I was 13. And forever, you know, I was just told, you know, you just got to, this is what you've got to deal with. You've got to go on the pill, um, hormone therapies. And that was what I just resigned myself to. Um, but it got to a point where I was experiencing pain all the time. Um, I was starting to gain weight and all the weight that I was gaining was around this midsection. And 
at that point, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do what I tell my clients to do. I'm going to put myself in a calorie restricted way of eating. Not only did it not help me lose weight, I gained more weight and my energy levels crashed. So working, you know, six days a week at the time was not really fun. <laughs> and um, it really made me think there has to be something else out there. So I did dig a little bit deeper and I did discover low carbohydrate nutrition. And so I started to really read the literature and practically implement it into my day to day. I was still extremely worried about fats at that point, um, so I wasn't really implementing a lot of saturated fats into my diet. So there was plenty of olive oils and there was lots of avocados, um, but I felt dramatically better. So my weight just melted off me. I don't like to use that word, but it really did. Within eight months, I lost eight kilos. And on my frame, you can really notice that. Um, the pain, it was really about the pain. The pain was just gone. And I started to notice that I had a lot more energy. My mood was a lot better. And that was when I started to look much further into low carb, high fat, um, but also into ketogenic. And that brings me to the second turning point which is Crohn's disease. Now, I don't have Crohn's disease, but my partner does. And he's had Crohn's disease for a really long time, for 17, 18 years. And when he was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, he was told um, a lot of the times that nutrition doesn't play a huge role. This is an autoimmune condition. You've, you've just got to resign yourself to the fact that you're on medication. He's had two bowel resections, six trichoplasties, um, ended up in hospital multiple times with really bad stricture pain. And it was after sort of we got together that I witnessed his, you know, the first stricture pain that brought him into hospital um, that I witnessed. And after that, I just went, you know what, that's it. I don't like this. This isn't normal. This isn't good. And so with him, I started to really look into gut healing protocols um, and the ketogenic approach. And 18 months into that protocol, he came off all his medication, he lost 22 kilos, it's actually a bit more now, and his markers were all normal. And so that is what brought me to my current phase, which is I'm a passionate advocate of science-based practice in low carb, high fat, and ketogenic nutrition. So I wanted to really talk a little bit about Sean's story. So this is my partner, two years ago, in 2015, he weighed 108 kilos. He was on Humira, and that was injected once a fortnight. He was still symptomatic at that point. He was osteopenic, he had active psoriasis, he was depressed, and he was anxious. <laughs> he doesn't pose well for photos, but this is him now. He has no idea I'm showing you this, by the way. <laughs> He's now 79 kilos. He's no longer on medication. He's completely asymptomatic. His bone density is restored. No more psoriasis, no more depression or anxiety. And his CRP, 18 months after starting it, restored down to five. He doesn't do well in photos. <laughs> so, LCHF, let's talk about it. What is LCHF? Originally, it was low carbohydrate, high fat. But with that came the question, what does low carb actually mean? You know, is low carb 20 grams of carbohydrates, 50 grams of carbohydrate, 90 grams of carbohydrate? Is that total carbohydrate? Is that net carbohydrate? Did quality matter? Did it vary person to person? The answer is absolutely yes. But the high fat part was the part that confused the most people. What does high fat mean? Because everyone's been eating a very low fat diet for such a long period of time. So high fat to them was just, oh, I'll drizzle a bit of olive oil. I'll cut up half or a quarter of an avocado to, to include in my meals. So high fat wasn't really a great way of defining it. And a lot of people were struggling with that. So I wanted to change that. And it wasn't my idea, but this has been retermed healthy fat by a lot of healthcare professionals and it's been widely now accepted that LCHF can alternatively take on low carb healthy fat. 
And I think with healthy fat, it gets people to really focus on the quality. And like Nina was talking about this morning, you know, really focusing on the quality, avoiding processed vegetable oils, and then including really good quality natural fats. And with that, people became a lot more comfortable um, and knowing that the fats that they were eating were contributing towards good health and not actually towards bad health. So, what are carbs? We've all heard of the term carbohydrates, but what are they? <coughs> Let's have a look. So the first thing is, we all know, <laughs> breads and cereals, the DAA loves to promote this group of food. But we also have dairy. We have starchy vegetables. We've got lentils and legumes, fruits. We've got vegetables, non-starchy vegetables nuts and seeds, and the obvious, the sweets. So obviously we're not gonna be talking about that group or that group, but let's have a look, because depending on whether you're vegetarian, vegan, or whether you do eat animal products, these foods can all be part of a well-formulated LCHF diet. Some of you may disagree and say, well, you know what, lentils and legumes, they're really high in carbohydrates, and I do agree with you, but for certain populations, we need to consider it. And that's the practical elements as dietitians we need to take into consideration. Some of you may say, oh no, dairy is no good. And I agree, for certain populations, if they're highly in, um, intolerant or if they've got inflammatory conditions, we don't recommend it. Sean doesn't touch dairy. But for the rest of us, we do need to have a look at how do we incorporate and what ones do we incorporate. So, how much carbs are in food? Let's take a look. Now, I've used as the baseline two slices of wholemeal bread. Now, the reason I've done that is because this is a constant battle that I have with fellow dietitians, prominent ones and others, and they all talk about how unsustainable, low carbohydrate or ketogenic way of eating is because they compare it to, oh, 50 grams of carbohydrate is just two slices of bread. And it's true, I mean, that's less than 50 grams of carbohydrates. Might be able to squeeze in a few more bits and pieces of raspberries or something. But let's use this as a basis and let's see how this compares to what typical LCHF food might look like. Banana's not too typical, but you'll see that one and a half medium bananas is equivalent in carbohydrate content to two slices of bread. 250 grams of potato is equivalent in total carbohydrates. 200 grams of sweet potato is equivalent to two slices of bread. Now these are the more starchy foods. Now let's start looking at the less starchy foods. Now I know lots of people who, you know, adopt an LCHF approach and they're too scared of pumpkins and carrots, but let's have a look and see, can you fit this in? And the truth is 900 grams of pumpkin has the same amount of carbohydrates as two slices of bread. Now who last ate 900 grams of pumpkin in a day? It gets fun. Carrots, seven medium carrots have the same amount of carbohydrates as two slices of bread. Again, when was the last time you ate seven whole carrots? Nine whole tomatoes has the same amount of carbohydrates as two slices of bread. And if you look, it's got double the amount of fiber as well, which means net carbohydrate or absorbable carbohydrate is actually far less. Lentils. One cup of cooked lentils has the same amount of carbohydrates as two slices of bread, but it's got far more fiber as well. So in terms of a choice, and this is something that we talk to our vegetarian clients or vegan clients about, is that you can use lentils in certain circumstances. But let's look at broccoli, 600 grams of boiled broccoli. Again, if you look at the fiber content, it's, it's increasing. So we've got almost 20 grams of fiber, which means net carbohydrate is only 22 grams. Raspberries, we can have three cups of raspberries. And this one takes the cake. Who last ate 1.1 kilos of spinach? That's 40 cups of spinach a day. 
So the next time someone says that low carb is unsustainable and that you're not going to get your fibre or your greens, you can tell them, do you eat 40 cups of spinach a day? Who thinks carbohydrates are in cheese? We all know that it's in there, but how much is in there? 100 grams of feta has 4.1 grams of total carbohydrates, which is not significant, but cheddar, 300 grams of it, is equivalent. Which is why hard cheeses are often a better choice when you're adopting a low carb or ketogenic approach. When it comes to different nuts, this is something that I see a lot. Um, clients who come in and go, oh, I'm doing low carb or I'm doing keto. Oh, okay, cool, what does your day look like? And they'll walk through their day and they go, oh, by the way, I eat nuts, I snack on nuts all day. It's like, well, what does that mean? It's like, oh, I've just got a jar of cashews next to me and I just grab a few and before you know it, a small handful, in fact, a level palmful of cashews will give you nine grams of carbohydrates. And if you've got a jar next to you at work and you're just grabbing a handful after a handful, you could be easily sending yourself from low carb territory into high carb territory. The lowest carbohydrate nut are your macadamias, where your total carbohydrate for 30 grams is 4.2 and then 2.7 of those is fiber. Let's look at protein. Now, when we talk about protein, there's a few questions that gets raised a lot. The first one is, do we know how much we're actually eating? When we talk about protein servings, do you know how much you're actually consuming? The second question is, do you know how much you should be consuming? What is your protein requirement? That depends on a few things and we'll talk about that. But at the end of the day, most people don't think about these things. And then let's just say you work out exactly how much protein you each need. And let's just say you know what that means in food terms. Are you then weighing it out based on raw weight or on cooked weight? Are we accounting for the changes to the volume of the meat when we cook it? Because 100 grams of raw weight red meat is going to cook down to about 80 grams cooked which will give you 20 grams of protein. Yet 100 grams of cooked weight meat will give you 30 grams of protein. So are we then undercalculating? <coughs> what about chicken? If you've got 100 grams of raw weight chicken, it will cook down to approximately 70, 80 grams. And therefore, the protein is calculated based on its cooked weight. Same thing with fish. When you've got 100 grams of raw weight salmon, it will cook down by about 25%. And we get about 15 grams of protein out of that serving of salmon. Who's shocked by this? Who's a bit worried that they might be under consuming protein or potentially even over consuming protein? What about cheese? I don't know many of you who would be consuming 180 grams of feta, at least I hope you're not, <laughs> but 180 grams of feta has 25 grams of protein, which is actually equivalent to 100 grams of cheddar. So whilst cheddar is much lower in carbohydrate, it is actually much higher in protein. So what are the equivalents? When we've got 100 grams of cooked weight beef, giving us 30 grams of protein, 160 grams of cooked white salmon giving us the exact same amount of protein and that's equivalent to five whole eggs or 375 grams of tofu. Now for those who are intermittent fasting the question is if you're breaking your fast and you're going oh you know what today I won't do a salad I won't do my chicken and salad or um, a meat I'll do eggs. How many of you then break your fast with maybe just a couple of scrambled eggs? In that case, are you meeting the same amount of protein as you would if you had a piece of meat to break your fast in your first meal? Because two eggs only has 12 grams of protein, whereas if you were normally consuming about 100 or a bit more than 100 grams of beef at lunch, 
you're going to be more than doubling your protein. Similarly with nuts, there are different protein quantities associated with different nuts. Almonds are the highest protein nut. So it's got seven grams of protein per 30 grams. But then we start to see across the board, walnuts, cashews, macadamias. Macadamias, whilst highest fat, is the lowest in protein. So if you're eating macadamias, don't do it for protein, do it for the fat. This topic is a big topic because it took me a really long time to get my own head around saturated fats. And this is one that you know, is widely um, accepted in the low carb community. But what do the experts say? The problem is the experts, the Australian Dietary Guidelines, have gotten it wrong. This is guideline number three pulled from the Australian Dietary Guidelines. And it tells us that foods high in saturated fats are biscuits, cakes, pastries, pies, processed meats, commercial burgers, pizza, fried food, potato chips, crisps, and other savoury snacks. Now, how many of these foods do regular LCHF people actually eat? Their definition of saturated fats is this. But actually, it's this. And I think this is a big part of the education process as a dietitian when we're trying to translate theory into practice is we have to get over a lot of hurdles ourselves because being trained in a set of guidelines, we have to then be able to look beyond those guidelines to really assess the food for what the food actually is. What about monounsaturated fats? We all know monounsaturated fats have olive oil and avocado as part of it, but who would have thought that tallow and duck fat and lard were also sources of monounsaturated fats. In fact, if you look at the breakdown of fats, lard is actually marginally higher in monounsaturated fats than it is in saturated fats. Then we've got polyunsaturated fats. And again, if you're looking very objectively at what they are, we've got omega-3s and we've got omega-6 rich fats. We have to consider options like flax seeds and chia seeds, even though not optimal, but for people who are vegetarian or vegan, they're the only viable sources. Then we've got walnuts, and then we've got grass-fed meats, free-range eggs, and oily fish. In terms of the omega-6 rich sources, we pretty much have all these processed oils, as Nina spoke about this morning. So the idea is, Apart from certain seeds and nuts, the rest of it, we just need to cut right out. So, how low should carbohydrates be? Is this a bit of a question that everybody has? Well, how low do I need to go? I understand the theory. You don't need to convince me anymore. I do understand it and I believe it and I want to do it. But now, what does it look like practically? The first thing we consider is metabolic flexibility or metabolic health. And we need to assess somebody's carbohydrate tolerance. And there's a few ways to doing that, but you can also assess it based on someone's insulin resistance. So for me, when I had PCOS and when I had my turning point, I actually went to the doctors and I went, you know what, I just want all these tests done. I want to see where I am. And my fasting insulin came back over 20. And you wouldn't think it. Um, and I just certainly didn't. So for me, cutting the carbohydrates was the most effective way for me to start dropping my weight. But for some people, athletes for example, they might be quite metabolically flexible. And therefore, do they need to drop their carbohydrates as low as I did? Probably not. And this is where the customization comes in. Someone's goals is really important. Are you trying to maintain weight? Are you trying to lose weight? Or are you after health benefits? Or are you after athletic performance? Is it, do you mind if you lose weight? Or do you not want to lose weight? For people who are in particular areas, they, they just want to maintain their weight um, and they just want to feel better. So they want to make sure their energy lasts longer. They may want to make sure they have the ability to go through their training um, and not conk out. So for them, it might not be to do with weight at all. 
So, therefore, in my role as a dietitian, it's to really figure those things out and then to go, well, mm, for you, you need to go as low as ketogenic levels, 20, 30 grams of carbohydrates, let's start with that. But for someone who's extremely metabolically flexible, believe it or not, 90 grams of carbohydrates is still very much low carbohydrate. The other thing we must take into consideration is total versus net carb. The difference between the two is total carbohydrate is the carbohydrate inclusive of fiber, whereas the net carbohydrate excludes the fiber element. Our body doesn't use the fiber for energy and therefore what we're really looking at is net carbohydrate. When it comes to protein, what does that look like for a person? We need to assess someone's physical health. Now, for most people who are healthy, you don't need to watch your protein as closely as they say. If you look at the guidelines, the guidelines will say 0.75 to 1.0 grams per kilogram body weight per day maximum. But in actual fact, your body can tolerate up to three plus grams per kilogram body weight of, of protein a day. So really we need to assess physical health. So if someone has end-stage renal failure, for example, will definitely be assessing their protein based on are you on dialysis yet or are you not? But for most healthy populations, we've got a much bigger range to work with than what we were taught. How much physical activity are they doing? Are they doing more resistance-based training? Or are they doing more endurance-based training? Are they trying to build muscle mass? All of these questions we take into consideration. The typical range that we sort of start off with is at 0.8 to 1.5. But we do grade that up quite a lot. For a lot of our patients, they end up on between 1.5 and 2.5 grams per kilogram body weight. And we'll assess that based on satiety, based on are they achieving their goals, and how they're feeling. The other question we get a lot of is can you have too much fat? Again, this comes back down to the original definition of LCHF being low carbohydrate, high fat. So the question is, well, how high can you go? And is it possible to go too high? Yes. The short answer is yes, you absolutely can. And it's extremely goal specific. So if somebody was trying to achieve a very deep state of ketosis, we may get them to eat a lot more and include intermittent fasting to extend them into that deep ketosis. But if someone was using it for purely for weight loss or for other health benefits, you don't necessarily need to go so high in fats. And a lot of people who are trying to lose weight actually don't realise that they're carrying a lot of the fats that they can be using. And therefore, without increasing dietary fats by very much, they're already holding a lot of fat stores. So let's put this all together. What does this look like in a day? So, case study is 45-year-old male. Fasting insulin is 26 and glucose is 5.1. So they're normal. Their blood glucose levels are normal. Their insulin, though, is suggestive of insulin resistance. They weigh in at 110 kilos. Most of the weight is around the belly. And their goal is to lose 20 kilos. They've got a family history of heart disease and looking at their lipids at a glance, total cholesterol is slightly high, not a bother, but triglycerides is a bit high and HDL looks a tad low. They run their own business and they have a sedentary job. So putting it all together for this case, we typically start someone on a very standard protocol of intermittent fasting. Incorporating to start with for this person who's carrying a lot more body fat and trying to lose weight, we're really adjusting one gram per kilogram total body weight to start with. Carbohydrates, we're dropping it to 50 grams total a day. And fats, we're aiming for two to three tablespoons per meal to begin with, and we can increase or decrease based on satiety. So what does it look like? Meal one, we've got them on 150 grams of cooked chicken with 200 grams of broccoli, one whole tomato, 100 grams of spinach. By the way, that's a lot of vegetables. We're getting them to add two tablespoons of olive oil and a tablespoon of butter as well. 
Now, who thinks that's a very satisfying meal? Who would eat that now? Probably not right now, because you've just had lunch. Meal two? A little bit more meat, 220 grams of cooked beef. And I've added in a few starchier vegetables. A medium carrot, a couple of hundred grams of cooked spinach, 200 grams of roast pumpkin. Now remember, this case study is not necessarily a real case. This is an exaggerated case. This is to show you how much you can actually eat, volume-wise, to meet your requirements. So if we break it down, we have 45 grams of protein in that first meal, 22 grams of total carbohydrates, of which 10 of those is fibre, and 40 grams of fat. And in the evening meal, we've got a touch higher, 65 grams of protein, 23 grams of carbs, 9, 9 grams of fibre, and 40 grams of fat. When you add up all the vegetables in this exaggerated case study, we've got close to a kilogram of vegetables. And based on Gary Fetke's presentation yesterday, where he was talking about the answer being lots of leafy greens, I think we've managed to achieve that. On a plate, what does that look like? First and foremost, I always recommend people to plate up their meats first. So on a plate, the meat will take up a good chunk of your plate, a third of your plate, if not a touch more. And then, I took a picture of my lunch yesterday. I actually plated it up based on what we want. And that's some vegetables piled up on that plate. So yesterday, apart from me being extremely hungry, who else ate a big lunch like that? Who put far less vegetables on their plate? <laughs> and what about fats? Over here is a tablespoon of olive oil. And over there it shows you what the equivalent of two tablespoons of butter is. That's the amount of fat we're essentially asking someone to add per meal. <coughs> Who actually does that? So depending on your goals, you may not need to do that. But we get a lot of clients who are very exhausted, who are run down, business owners like that. And in their case, they need some sort of energy to sustain them. And when they've cut their carbohydrates right back, how else are they going to have the energy to keep them going throughout the day, keep them mentally very focused and clear, and keep them making good decisions? <laughs> so from this point, there are adjustments that can be made. Usually the adjustment that we would make is we'll increase protein as needed. Now that amount of food is usually a good amount to start with for someone weighing that amount of weight. But for someone who weighs a lot less, one gram per kilogram body weight would not touch the sides. Therefore, we typically start off with 1.8 or two grams per kilogram body weight. And then we can adjust fats to satiety. Normally when someone hasn't done LCHF previously, we would start them on some more dietary fats. So they feel satisfied, the cravings go away, they feel like they can really keep to this way of eating. But as they go and as they become more and more fat adapted, we tend to draw the fats back and get them to assess how hungry they are at any particular meal or on any particular day. And if they're a bit more hungry, to add a bit more fats, and if they're less hungry, to adjust it down. So I guess that is what it looks like and the thought processes that we have when we're turning it from a theoretical to a practical. What does it look like, the education that we typically give? But I guess it does make it a bit difficult when you're an accredited practicing dietitian. And as dietitians, we are very much regulated within to go by a certain set of rules and regulations. So it was extremely difficult to begin with for me to start recommending LCHF as a dietitian. This was my first sort of real attack at the DAA. I wrote a blog um, at them, and this was the thing that really set me off going, you know what? As an LCHF dietitian, we need a lot more of a voice. We need to be able to vocally engage with them in a scientific manner. And that was that. And then it just kind of rolled forward. On top of that, we're really much about applying it. We apply it on a practical level. 
we get people thinking about the science and we also set up the Keto Clinic, which is a place where people who have dabbled in reading about keto can really come to, to actually get that practical hand-holding. And I often say to people, every bite you take is either fighting disease or it's feeding it. Thank you very much.